you have a joint yet, text moral to 909-75. So we are here. We need to go to the main Poor People's Campaign on Facebook. We need to share the live feed. There are thousands of people watching around the country, around the world. We need you to help get the word out about this beautiful event that's happening. Share that out to all your friends. Tell your folks that it's not too late to come join us in Portland. We're, we're pretty full to bursting, but we haven't bursted yet. We, got, we, can, we can get some more in this room. Make sure you share that out. Hashtag Poor People's Campaign. And then right behind me, you see the sign that says text moral to 90975. Awesome. It got a, lot, a little quiet in here. Poor People's Campaign! Poor People's Campaign! A national call for moral revival! A all right, all right. Let's thank them for coming up and all of the people are welcome online, 90975 text tomorrow. Because we not only have to be a, a loud movement, but loud but right. We just try to be loud and wrong. That's why we do great study and make sure we have footnotes for everything. But we also must be an organized movement and a connected movement. How many of you will admit that sometimes you use your cell phone for the wrong thing? Okay, okay, no, most folks now, okay. Use it for the right thing tonight and push this out to at least 10 or 12 people. And when you get home, we're asking you to send this out to at least 50 people and ask each one of those persons, are they registered to vote? And if they say yes, will they commit to registering or encouraging at least 10 other people? We must build a movement of register people for the movement and who vote and who vote in this critical time. Let me apologize, I was sitting in front of the signer uh, and I did not realize it was blocking, so we always wanna make sure that everybody is welcome in this place, in our space. Also, children, they do have, but you don't have to take children out because one of the greatest tragedies in this country right now is the number of children who are living in poverty and low wealth. And we welcome children to be heard. We welcome children to be seen, and we welcome children to be loved, right? And so I want you to know that children always have a place. Even if they make some noise, that means they're alive, and we ought to be hollering just like they're hollering sometimes. Right? Now, in this movement, yeah, there we go, there we go. Now in this movement, it is all, yes, we have joy. There's an ancient scripture that says, the joy of the Lord or the joy of the spirit is our strength. We sing, but we're very serious. The songs we sing are about the movement. They're not just songs, they're not just music. We, there's a rhythm to freedom. Sometimes those songs are deep and teary. Sometimes those songs are strong and fiery, but we sing. But we also wanna make people know, don't mistake us for being happy because we are not happy, we are hopeful, but we are not happy about what's going on in this country and what's been going on and the way in which systemic racism and poverty and ecological devastation and the war economy and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism is hurting us. And so we wanna put a face on the facts. You can't just have facts. So we want you to hear now, people who are living under some of the most extreme circumstances. And when I say that, I don't mean that, that they're just homeless. There are people working every day and living in poverty. We want you to see the faces of people who are organizing all around this country, people who are coming together that people don't expect to come together and why we must together build this movement. So would you hear, would you listen, would you see, would you be touched? Would you cry with those who cry? But after you cry with those who cry, 
would you have enough foolishness of faith to believe that what other people say can't be done, can be done. We must be honest about the foundations of the political and economic systems we call America. I love America because of her potential, but I know that America will never even get close to being a more perfect nation until we are honest about the politics of rejection. I want to tell you about some of the leaders who are building the Poor People's Campaign. Callie Greer from Selma, Alabama, who had to bury her daughter, Venus, because she didn't have health care. I'm here today to share my daughter's Venus's story. Venus discovered a small lump in her breast and she wasn't insured. Venus had to be approved for every prescription and every piece of medical equipment that she needed. I'm standing here today in solidarity with the Poor People's Campaign because no one should have to bury their child in America because they don't have health care insurance. I'm 46 years old. I've lived in poverty here in West Virginia every day of my life. And I'm working. I am working poor with a bachelor's degree. I'm doing the best I can with what I have. I'm a second generation fast food worker and I've experienced the cycle of poverty firsthand. Growing up, I watched my mother endure long hours of back-breaking labor, doing everything she could to feed me and my sisters. My employer barely pays me enough to pay rent and utilities, let alone with the medical expenses with my mother. I worked 41 years in the coal mines. I have black lung, and it's just unfathomable what these poor coal miners That's right. have to go through in order to get what they have worked for and deserve. I'm a Vietnam veteran. My only chance of going to college was joining the Army. It was one thing to know that you didn't have water and you couldn't afford your water. It's a whole nother to find out that they shut off your entire community and none of you matter. But when I lost my housing, health care, and income all at the same time, I was terrified, panicked. Hi, my name is Pamela Rose. I'm from Downs County, Alabama. And I live in a mobile home with my two kids. <laughs> and I got raw sewage. I don't have no, no money on power. And I had to travel back and forth to Birmingham to take my daughter with the CPAP machine. Don't have a car and don't have no way to take her. This is the largest encampment in Aberdeen. There's about 1,000 people in a town of 16,000 who are homeless. In my community, we were all shut off for the day because none of us could afford our water bills. In the past, my family wasn't able to afford electricity in the winter. It was very hard on all of us. This wall. This is sin of the highest order. When there are 38 million poor children, when 60% of African Americans are poor, when 65% of Latinx are poor, when 40% of Asians are poor, when there are 67 million poor white people, we must say, this is not right. And it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. Our brothers and sisters are sleeping on the streets. For a country this rich to have so many people poor, it's immoral and it's wrong. Our backs are against the wall, and we got no choice but to push. <laughs> We lift our voices for justice. We put our bodies on the line for mercy. And together we will proclaim liberty throughout the land for the enslaved, for the poor, and for us all. Yeah. Yeah. Follow that breaking news in Albany where a large group of protesters have moved into the street. Washington Avenue between City Hall and Lark Street closed down. Protesters with the Poor People's Campaign of Indiana. Two o'clock on the East Coast. Two o'clock in the middle, two o'clock on the west coast. A wave, and the historians tell us it's never happened before. Our 
communities, Muslim communities, who have joined the Poor People's Campaign. You can count on us. Our democracy is in trouble. Our democracy is in trouble. And we come to demand. And we come to demand. Second warning. Because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard. No one is listening. We write letters, we make calls. No one is listening. So we gotta make our, find a way to make ourselves heard. We are the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And we are here. We are poor. We are clergy. And we're here to say to our nation's capital and to the highest court in this land that everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to learn. Everybody has a right to love. Everybody has a right to living wages. Everybody has a right to vote. Everybody has a right to thrive, to thrive in this society. Everybody say, ah! Oh! I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. Freedom fighter, and he taught us how to fight. Freedom fighter, and he taught us how to fight. The poor and the clergy. We read Article 6 of the Kentucky State Constitution that says we have a right to free assembly. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. to save the heart and the soul of this democracy and this world. Somebody's, somebody hurting our people and we won't be silent anymore. That is the chant that we say every time somebody testifies or every time somebody tells their stories. We were somewhere and a person said, don't clap. When I stand up and say that I'm barely making it, when I stand up and say that people are dying from, from, from lack of health care, they said, don't clap at my story. Join me. Join me in making the nation hear it. Join me in fighting for a way that my story is no longer representative of truth. Join me until my story is fiction. And so what we choose to do after somebody testifies is to shout, somebody, somebody is, hurting is hurting our people and we won't be silent, won't be silent anymore. anymore. Whenever we come in these places, you know, we, we, can't, we don't do silo movements, we, it's interlocking. You can't come anywhere in America and not honor the land, the original people who were on the land. To try to do that and move forward is, is just wrong, right? We have to honor the indigenous people. When we talk about our Latino brothers and sisters, some movement has to stop calling people undocumented and aliens when they're simply coming back to land that was theirs in the first place. Texas belonged to Me Mexico and before it was Texas and New Mexico. We have to, truth is the only thing that can set us free. And this movement must be built on truth. We need massive turnout from Maine. Every church bring a bus. Every city bring a bus. Every county bring a bus. Every club bring a bus. And we need to just spread it all over the country. If, we, if every city in the country would just bring one bus, just every city, right? Every county would just bring one bus, not two, just one and we might have a massive gathering in our nation's capital, not as an end, not as an end. And this is not about ending. This is about continuing. This is long-term. This is pushing deep into the transformational consciousness of this nation. I want to raise tonight. I'm good. I want to raise tonight. I want to raise tonight a text from Hebrews, an ancient text, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 39. When um, 
the people who were in this movement following this brown-skinned Palestinian Jew who had the audacity to list, list the poor, the broken, the bruised, the battered, the captives, and everybody that were made to feel unaccepted as the key as of his focus, as the vision for his movement. And that was at the beginning of his movement, and then just before he was assassinated by the state for being a revolutionary, he came back to that same group. He said, every nation, not every individual church, but every nation, every government would be judged by whether they cared for the poor, the hungry, the sick, the immigrant, and those on the margins. And he said every nation and every religion that refused to do those things about justice was a form of hypocrisy. And for that, they killed him, but nonviolently he stood up and exposed the nation's ugliness. And when this text was written in Hebrews 10.39, some of the people that had followed this brown-skinned Palestinian Jew who had been born in the ghetto, a place called Nazareth, he had been crucified and raised, but he wasn't walking with them, and they were getting worn out. They were thinking about turning back because, see, by this time, and even in his day, there was this whole history, a lineage of these guys that loved to run the country and they loved to put their names on buildings. <laughs> they were arrogant as all get out, you know. They believed the world turned around. It wasn't just one of them, it was a whole cadre of them, right? And they, they catered to the wealthy and they destroyed the least of these and they even put their faces on the money right and uh, they called themselves Trump I mean Caesar <laughs> Caesar and 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 this particular by this time the Caesars were just going for it I mean they were just hurting people and the people that were in the movement were thinking about just what quitting and we think it was the Apostle Paul, it could have been someone else, said, wait a minute, do you know who you are? And in Hebrews 10, turn this up, some Hebrews 10, 39, he says, look, we are not of those who shrink back unto destruction, but we are those who persevere unto the salvation of the soul. One translation says, we are not those who quit, but we are those who keep right on getting up, rising up, no matter what. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In essence, the writer was saying, in the midst of great tribulation and trial and political violence, you, we must know who we are because properly defining oneself and one's nature and one's calling is critical. It is a critical philosophical and theological discipline that has penetrating and practical implications, particularly when you're in crisis. When you are facing a season of challenge and confronting threats that seek to take your identity and seek to redefine you, who you are, seek to ignore you, when you're in a fight and we are facing what Paul Tillich called the very threat of non-being and non-existence, knowing who you are is critical in the face of enemies and adversaries that are trying to take from you who you are. Martin Luther King once did not diagnose some of Amer America as having a neurotic sickness and a septic commitment to racism, poverty, militarism that was destroying America's soul and ripping it apart. 
And he said, the only way to address these matters, we have to rise with others and raise up a campaign with poor people and moral leaders and those who have nothing to lose are the only ones that might have the moral and spiritual capacity to turn the nation's consciousness and character towards the way of love, truth, and justice, and nonviolence. And my friends, just moving up some because I have such a sensitive ear and hear so here. We are in one of those moments now. The issue for, for us now is not can the Democratic Party survive and not can the Republican Party survive, but can America be? It is a question that Langston Hughes asked in the 1930s, but it is more real today when he said, America, America, America has never been America to me, but I swear this oath that America will be. But the question is before us, will America be? And we're in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We're here to demand more from America. America can be better. America can move closer to being a more perfect union. This is the third reconstruction time. The first reconstruction was the time immediately after slavery. Second reconstruction was the Civil Rights Movement, 54 to 68, 1954 to 68. We're in the midst of the birth pains of a third reconstruction. And some folk know it and they do not want it to happen because every reconstruction of America has always faced pushback. The more tool, we, we must do more, mobilizing, organizing, registering, and educating people for the movement who vote tour is about turning our demands into action. We began in El Paso by invitation. The deaths were there. The Latinos said, come back and start here and talk about all the issues because we don't want to only talk about racism and white nationalism when somebody is, some people are gruesomely shot as, because that is a form of white nationalism. But often that form of white nationalism comes after rhetoric and policy of white nationalism has been, has been sown into the wind, we sow to the wind and we reap the whirlwind. And our Latino brothers and sisters said, don't isolate us, because we understand that the same folk that are against Latino immigrants are against health care, and against public education, <laughs> and against voting rights, and against the LGBT community. We understand that. So we began in El Paso, we end in Texas, excuse me, in Tennessee, in the Mississippi Delta, and then we go on to D.C. more, mobilizing the poor people and their allies, or oh, organizing moral fusion coalitions, or registering people for the movement that vote, educating our people about the issues that we must be concerned about. And the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral violence, is not another organization. See, we don't need any more organizations. We got enough. We need organizations to put down their organizational egos and come together. That's what we need. And so Liz and I are not saying, let us take over all the organizations. We want folk to keep their organization. It's important that you do silo work. It's important that your pinky finger works. It's important that your thumb works. But if you want power every now and then, all of them have to come together. You never... They didn't have an abolition organization, they had an abolition movement. They didn't have a women's suffrage organization, they had organizations, but all of them formed a movement. A movement. And, and we ought to be able to come together and do some significant things together to build power and shift the narrative. Because if we never shift the narrative and shift the, 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 the um, political imagination, the moral imagination, then you're never gonna have moral implementation. You're never gonna have it. And so that's what the Poor People's Campaign is about, a national call for moral revival. All of us finding ways to come together across all of our lines and believing that we are not those who shrink back. We are not those who quit. There's a reason why all of you all are here tonight in this place. Some with gray hair, 
some with not so gray hair. I like to say to the ones with gray hair, you got to suit up one more time. I, I like to say those with less gray hair, it's time to pay your debt for all the stuff other people did for you that you might have what you have. And I like to say to the real young folk, you might as well learn how to fight early. We are not of those. This movement is about saving the soul of this nation. The soul of this nation is in trouble. In trouble. We are here because systemic poverty is, racism is real. And when we say racism, we are not talking about somebody calling you the N-word. We are not talking about somebody calling people names. We're talking about policy, like racist voter suppression, like mistreatment of people of color immigrants, like mass incarceration, resegregation of public schools, and the continued oppression of native people, indigenous. That's racism. That's why sometimes we say in this campaign, Adam, even though the media likes to say it, the greatest racist right now in politics is not Trump. I knew y'all weren't going to say nothing. <laughs> See, because Trump is loud and out there. And there's a book called Stamp from the Beginning, and it talks about how the words are distractions from the policy. They want us to get focused on the great, the person with the most influence over white nationalist racist policy being placed into our system right now is Mitch McConnell. And you, you've not heard him say any ugly words. Hmm? And, and please don't act like Trump is new. Reagan used the same language. Nixon used the same language. They just didn't have a 24-hour news cycle, and they were smart enough not to say it out in public. Or maybe Trump is shrewd and smart, or at least those around him. Because if we keep the focus on him, we miss all of the judges he's putting on the bench. Y'all see, and all the other policies. Mitch McConnell, for instance, along with Boehner and, and Ryan, held up fixing the Voting Rights Act for over 2,000 days. Think about that. We have less voting rights today than we had August 6, 1965. And yet, Strom Thurmond held up fixing the Civil Rights Act of 57 for one day. And we call Strom Thurmond a racist. America's in trouble, and we have to know it, but then we have to have a movement of people that know it doesn't have to be that way. Touch your neighbor said the work is real. Just touch him. We do this down south. I'm just eating. Touch, touch your neighbor and say the work is real. Yeah, yeah. Did you know that long before Trump was ever even thought about running, 23 states in this country passed racist voter suppression laws since 2010? 50, targeting 54% of African-American voters. But did you know that the people who get elected by racist voter suppression laws, once they get elected, they pass policies that hurt mostly white people? Now, that's the irony. The very ones that suppress the vote, when they get elected, they pass laws that mostly hurt poor, low-income white people because there are 66 million poor and low-income white people. There are 26 million poor and low-income black people. That's 61% of all black people. It's only 30% of all white people, but it's 40 million difference in raw numbers. So that is why you cannot see the fight against racist voter suppression as just black folks fight. Because racism is not just about being against America, black folk. Racism is against democracy itself. It's against democracy itself. That's why we see what we're seeing now, so many attacks on democracy. And this guy that acts like he wants to be a king. Why? Because now that certain people are no longer in the majority, they no longer want to push democracy. Now that there's a possibility for black, white, and brown people to come together and elect candidates of their choice, all of a sudden, somebody's cheating. <laughs> all of a sudden, we need photo ID. All of a sudden, like here in Maine, we have to pass racist voter suppression laws against the native people and indigenous people. Did you know 
that there's, yes, you heard Liz say there are 140 million people of poor and low income, and she gave you the numbers. I got you. You know how it is. But did you know, did you know that 600 people die every day from poverty? 600 people die every day from poverty and low wealth. 600 people every day. Now, watch this. If one person gets shot by a racist cop, we're in the street, and we should be. Seven people died from vaping, and it's a national crisis. 600 people die every month, every day from poverty. And you don't even hear poverty in our political debates. Did you know there's abundance of resources? Did you know that legislators, Congress people make an average of $15 a minute? But we've locked people up who make $15 an hour. Did you know the largest number of people who are homeless are LGBTQ children, youth, youth? 30 million people, people don't have health care, but here's the, here's the piece on that. Here's the piece on that. 30 million people don't have health care, but for every 1 million people, about 6,000 die. If we took 300 if we had a single payer health system, it would save $310 billion. But even deeper than that, Reverend, there's a group of clergy, I hope some of y'all will join us. We've decided if anybody in our church dies from the lack of health care, we're going to ask the families to allow us to have an open casket funeral like Mamie Teal did for her baby. Bring the media in, and we're not going to lie anymore and say God called them home. We're going to say God will welcome them home, but government killed them. Did you know four million families, you heard Liz talk about water, but four million families get up every morning, they can buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water. Did you know not only do we lie about Latino immigrants and, and say they're, they're illegal when they're simply coming back the land we stole that Abraham Lincoln stood against and Henry David Thoreau stood against, his first act of civil disobedience was against the Spanish-American War or Mexican War, but did you know that if, that if it wasn't for the social security payments that Latinos put into the social security system that they will never have access to, the system, your social security, would implode. Did you know that Native, Amer Native Americans, indigenous people are still seen as wards of the state? They still operate under war, war uh, treaties. They can't even own their own homes. Did you know that we have 800 military bases around the world, 800. Did you know we could cut $350 billion from our military spending and we would still have a military budget bigger than China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea combined? Did you know people are making a killing off of killing? Did you know people are living in homeless camps? Like we visited one and this lady, was a lady there and a white lady and a black woman. The white lady had had a health crisis. She had been middle class, health crisis, now she's homeless. Black man worked every day, had to live in the homeless camp. They were down the path in the woods from a church that had on its billboard, gay people are going to hell. And 200 yards from that church were poor children, poor women living in the woods and when we went down there the one thing they said to us is don't forget us don't let America forget us and by the way did you know there's this extreme religious nationalism I hope nobody's preaching it's really a form of heresy it's a form of a theological malpractice at best heresy it goes it goes like this the way to please God is to hate gay people um uh be against women's right to choose, be for prayer in the school, be for tax cuts, and you know God loves guns, so be for guns and wave the flag. Even though in the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible, the old, what we call Old New Testament, there are more than 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that say how we treat the poor and women and children and the immigrants is what's most important to the divine spirit. 
and yet those that are influencing so much of the Congress, so much of state houses and the president are those who believe in this false religious narrative that comes from slaveholder religion and has had various metamorphoses down through history even till now. I often tell folk, why are you so interested in somebody else's bedroom? Huh? And I tell them, I want to talk about sex, Bishop. I really do. You know the sex I want to talk about? I want to talk about the illicit relationship between the Supreme Court and big business that produced the bastard child of Citizens United. That's the sex I want to talk about. That's the sex I want to talk about. But in Maine, it's not just national. 41% of all people in Maine are poor and low wealth. In Maine, you have to work 80 hours a week just to or, uh, afford a basic two-room bedroom apartment. And it doesn't have to be this way. If we pass the $15 federal minimum wage, not 12 years from now, but immediately, 49 million porkers work wages would go up and it would pump $328 billion a year back into the economy. If we repeal the Trump tax cut and establish fair taxes on the wealthy and corporation, it would generate $886 billion per year to rebuild our infrastructure and education and health care. If in 2018, if we just ended the military contract of one company, one company, not two, just one, it could fully fund the 14 states expanding Medicaid or the Affordable Care Act who have refused to it. Just one. Just one. Somebody say just one. So here's where we are and why we have to gather and why we have to build a movement. All over this country, state houses, governors, legislators, some of the most radical are in the mo uh, poorest states. And yes, the Supreme Court has gutted the Voting Rights Act. And yes, we have people in the United States Senate and House and other places who are pushing programs to hurt the poor and deny workers. And yes, the same people that do that support the wall. And the same people that support the wall want to block health care. And the same people that want to block health care want to block living wages. And the same people that block living wages, they want to block any effort to deal with climate change. And the, most of those same people hide behind a false religious narrative that says nothing about racism and homophobia and poverty. And yes, they are spending more and more money on militarism. And yes, they have a lot of money. But in the face of this, we must know who we are. We must know who we are. Frederick Douglass in the 1800s faced a time like this. A guy had been forced onto the Supreme Court that had no business being there. His name was Justice Taney. And he became the Supreme Court Justice that oversaw the Dred Scott decision. And the Dred Scott decision came out and said a black man has no rights that a white man ever has to honor. Two months after that decision, Frederick Douglass was asked to speak. How you feel? What you going? Don't you believe that the abolition movement is over now? I mean, the Supreme Court has ruled. Let me tell you what Douglas said. Douglas said, the slaveholders are earnest. They mean to cling to their slaves as long as they can to the bitter end. And yes, the Supreme Court of the United States has ruled, but there's another Supreme Court, <laughs> higher than the Supreme Court of man. He said, yes. Goliath was big, but have you read the rest of the story about David? He said, what I see in this moment, he said, I, I, I have cheer. I'm, I'm actually somewhat happy. He said, because I know that every attempt to blot out forever the hopes of the enslaved people may just be one necessary link in the chain of events preparatory to the downfall and complete overthrow of the whole slave system. He then said the whole history 
of the anti-slavery movement is studied with proof that all measures devised and executed with the view to allow and diminish the anti-slavery agitation have only served to increase, intensify, and embolden that agitation. There comes a time that when your adversary is hitting you hard, that's a sign of how strong you are. Don't you know they wouldn't be lying so much and spending so much money and blocking the vote so much if we were not powerful together? And so we have to come to a point that every attack on the poor will embolden our agitation. Every attack on sick folk will embolden our agitation. Every attack on, on immigrants will embolden our agitation. Mother Jones, Mother Jones, that great white labor and women's voting right later, she went to a meeting in the 1800s and they were praying. She said, listen here, I don't need your organization to be a praying institution. I need you to be a fighting institution. She said, what we need is folk that know how to pray for the dead but fight like hell for the living. <laughs> Cesar Chavez said, get it started. Whatever you got to do to get a movement started, get it started. Because once a social change movement begins, it cannot be reversed. Once you uneducate people and help them to understand that they don't, things don't have to be like this, you cannot humiliate that person who understands that they don't have to give in to oppression anymore. <laughs> Nelson Mandela was in prison 27 years. But every day he was in prison, he went through some depression. But then there came a place where he steeled his spine. And every morning he looked at the bars and looked at the guards and he said, out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the failed clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the I am the master of my fate and I am the captain of my soul. It's fighting time, y'all. It's time to fight with love and fight with truth and fight with grace and fight with our votes. No matter what the forces of hate and injustice do, we are not those who quit. We are not those who shrink back. We must show America another way. We cannot just curse the darkness. We must show the light. And just so you know, as I close, do you know the power that we have to rise? If I was down south, I'd say, turn to your neighbor and ask your neighbor, do you know the power that we have to rise? Because see, some of us have, have listened to the wrong report. You've listened to Donald Trump's report. You've listened to Fox News report. And we're moping around and crying like we don't have any power. But I come from a tradition that asks the question, whose report you gonna believe? I'm gonna believe the report of the Lord. Do you know that we have power that's untapped? 286,000 people in Maine didn't even vote the last time. That's power, that's power. 140 million poor people represent more than the amount of people that voted last time. That's power. 100 million people in America that could vote didn't vote because they never heard their name or their situation or their issues. That's power. If just 2% of poor and low wealth people would register and vote and engage, they could change political systems all over this country. That's power. Trump didn't win. He cheated. They said he won by 30,000 votes in Wisconsin. Well, there were 250,000 votes suppressed. They said he won in Michigan by 10,000 votes. Well, there are 100,000 African Americans in Detroit that were already registered that didn't vote. They said he won in other states, but there are hundreds of thousands of people that could vote, that didn't vote, and they've been turned off. We got to turn them on. We've got to bring them not just to vote, but into the movement because there is power that is untapped. 
And I come from a tradition that says if God be for you, it doesn't matter who's against you. I come from a tradition that says one can chase a thousand and two can put 10,000 to flight. I come from a tradition that says weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I've read about the abolition movement. They changed the world. I've read about the women's suffrage movement. They changed the world. I've read about the bonus marches in the 1930s. They changed the world. I've read about the social gospel movement. They changed the world. I've read about the civil rights movement. They changed the world. I've read about the anti-war movement. They changed them all. It's our time to rise up and change the world. Now, there are some people that have been telling us for the last few years, get woke. You heard them say that? They say, get woke. But we say in our movement, you got to do more than get woke. Because you can be awoke, you can wake up and still be in bed. That's why Mavis Staples, when she paid tribute to, to, to our dear sister, Nina Simone, she said, it's not the waking, baby, it's the rising. <laughs> She said it's, it's the grounding of a foot uncompromising. It's not the foregoing of the lie. It's not the opening of the eyes. It's the waking. It's not the rising. She said it's not the shade we should be cast in. It's the light and it's the obstacle that cast it. It's the heat that drives the light. It's the fire that it ignites. It's not the waking. It's the rising. So it's time for us to not only be woke, but to get out of the bed, get in the streets, get in the legislative suites and get in the ballot box. And when we do that, we can cry power. Nina Simone cried power. Mother Jones cried power. Harriet Tubman cried power. Fannie Lou Hamer cried power. Martin Luther King cried power. Rabbi Hesher cried power. Dorothy Day cried power. It's time for us to rise and cry power. We've got power to turn America around. We've got power to make this nation different. We've got power, 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 when we all come together. Are you ready? Are you ready? There's an army rising. There's a nonviolent army rising. There's an army of truth. There's an army of love. There's an army of mercy. There's an army of grace. And you are alive in this moment to sign up. All you got to do to sign up is say, I'm willing to stand for what's right. Stand against racism. Stand against poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy. Stand against the false moral narrative. And not only stand against the darkness, but join us in pushing this moral justice budget. Our America has never been America to me. But I swear this oath that America will be. It's time to rise and have power so that the day will come when our children's children will sing our names. And they will say that in the day when others felt like shrinking, we didn't shrink because we were not of that crowd. Instead, we rose. We rose to the challenge. And we made it better for generations yet unborn. Come here, Yara. We need buses. We need voices. Every church, every county, every place. We can do this, y'all. Didn't but 52 people march in the first march in Birmingham. Give me that cane. And they ended up changing. Didn't but a few 50 or so people march the first Selma march and they changed. Then but 43,000 people be in the bonus marches, but they changed history for millions, for millions. The people before us had less than we had. We cannot do less with more. We cannot do less with more. But the time is now for us to stop crying and stop moaning and rise up and cry power with love and truth and nonviolence in order to transform and change America. And that
thereby change the world. There's an army rising. As you take your seat, I hope you signed up. You may be seated. I hope you signed up. And while Yara sings this last song and before they close out, would you grab somebody by the hand? They're going to join this army with you. And as she sings, if you, you, if you feel like lifting hands together, but there's an army rising that's going to break the chains of poverty, break the chains of apathy, break the chains of racism. We may not do it all, but we're going to get a lot done. And if we die doing it, we're going to sow the seeds for more revolution. See, when you get into movement and you get in revolution, you never really lose. You either sow the seeds for transformation or you become the transformation. And you really don't know sometimes. You just get in it. And God, the spirit, whatever you call it, that's the one that determines whether this movement will be the transformation or whether this movement will sow the seeds for the transformation. But the one thing I don't want to be is sleep or awake, but not out of bed. There's an army. Would you stand, please? And grab somebody by the hand, if you would. I want you to sing this with us.
Yeah. 